Kara, it's Women's History Month. What meaning does that have for the two of you? Well, to me, Women's History Month is about empowerment, finding a voice for females and courage. That's what it's about for me. Kara, when did you enlist? I was commissioned as a United States officer um, with United States Air Force in 2000. From there, I went to officer training school. I did eight years active duty. After that, five years in the reserves. What motivated you to enlist in the military? I always had a passion for my country. My father, who is now deceased, he served four years in the United States Army. My brother then served four years in the United States Army during the Gulf War. So I I went to college, you know, I, I won't be, uh, I'll be honest, I, I had a Marine boyfriend and I thought being on base was really cool. And I said, I want to do that too. <laughs> now you were already a nurse, right? Yes, ma'am. I was okay. already a nurse and had a college degree. So I was commissioned as an officer and joined because I, I, I thought working on a, in a hospital, on a ward, um, every day for the rest of my life seemed pretty boring. And I wanted to travel and serve my country and see what else was out there. Car, does it take a special type of woman to serve in the military? Absolutely. Tell us about that. <laughs> Absolutely. To serve in the military as a woman or, or, or as a man, you have to be tough, strong, flexible, adventurous, and have a lot of integrity. What frustrations did you face in the service? You know, very typical frustrations, I think, that are maybe not especially female-specific. But, you know, it's a rank-oriented structure. Learning the rank structure, learning my place, learning how to use my voice was was challenging, for sure. Learning how to use your voice, what does that mean? Well, in a rank structured environment, you know, I've done a lot of thinking about this in the last 24 hours because I, I, I first want to say I love the military. I love United States Air Force and I do it over and over again. I love the Air Force and I love the military. However, in reflection, in the last 24 hours, there were some big challenges for sure. I think back, you know, rank is, rank is, is number one. But if I look back at it, Male figures hold the most rank. <laughs> or the power, would you and say? And the power, yes. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to say that until today. I looked at it. You know, I was like, no, it was just about rank. It's rank. It's rank. I mean, I knew my place. I love the military. We're all equal. But, you know, I was married to an Air Force pilot. I'm a nurse. And absolutely, male-oriented professions are on top. And the females are on the bottom, and we are trying to find our place, I guess. I don't know. Cara, did you feel that you had to work harder than your male counterparts? No, I never did, actually. I, I felt like I had to work harder than the day I did before. And that's what the military and my family of origin taught me, is to keep working hard. What discriminations did you face, if any? In retrospect, I, you know, I had to do some soul searching about this last night in preparation. As, as a new lieutenant in the military, I had a real a quick, short, romantic relationship with a superior officer right when I came in and when I wanted it to stop. And I ended the relationship. He became very harassing mm. and and it wouldn't stop. When I went to our, both of our superiors, he did not do anything about it. Um, instead of punishing the the male, he, he punished me. I was moved to a different unit, and the actually the, the other gentleman uh, proceeded to make rank. I, I really continued to struggle very much from that point on. First, I want to thank you for this interview. It's very significant. I can tell just by your facial expressions and the tone of voice that the last 24 hours have been an 
opportunity for you to really think about what was your experience like. And yet, I'm really sensing from you a true dedication to the military and to the Air Force, which I want to thank you for your service. But when I was doing the research, this was an article that came out like in 2016 as far as prominent issues for women in the military. And I'm wondering if you think these still exist. One is expected to perform sexual favors to advance. Another is military clothing and equipment do not fit. They're made for men, not for women. That female medical issues are not addressed or acknowledged. That there's an unwillingness to deal with sexual assaults. And misrepresentations from recruiters about what to expect. Are these comfortable questions for you to answer? Well, they're very they're very difficult questions. I wouldn't say they're necessarily comfortable at all. No, I bet not. Um, they bring tears to my eyes, actually. One thing I can tell you about sexual assault is, honestly, I don't think this is a military problem. I think it is a worldwide problem. Mm-hmm. One in four people, one in four women are sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And I don't think the numbers are more in the military. I really don't. I can't come in here and say that. But, uh, you know, I was sexually assaulted in Iraq uh, while on a one-year deployment. And it was the last three weeks of my deployment. I was the sexual assault nurse examiner assigned to my base. God. So I did the sexual assault exams. So when I was assaulted, I was attacked by a, a stranger uh, across base uh, from the Army. Not that that means anything. Um, late night coming back from a mission and three weeks going, getting to go back home to my new husband. I didn't report, let alone, I didn't want to report and who was going to be the nurse examiner. (laughs) It was me. And I knew that was going to stop my return home because there would be a case involved. And so anyway, that's, that's one thing about. So you avoided that. I avoided it. I did not report. I did not tell anyone until I came home. When I did come home, I was more or less treated as, I, I, I was not supported. I, my only, my only thing with the military really is that when I needed help and I was slightly broken or fractured and not well, I was no longer useful. Mm. So the military doesn't offer any type of counseling or any platforms or programs to help you? They do. I mean, overseas, it's very limited. Overseas, it was a a chaplain. (laughs) Was it a male chaplain? It was a male chaplain (laughs) who was very afraid of my very large six foot five pilot husband (laughs) and um, just let him. So yes, they do offer services, but well, if if I could jump in, yes, and I think sure. what you're saying, and is this is that, Allison Perry who's stepping in. I think what you're saying is, yeah, yeah, there are the technically there are services there, but you you serve your country, you're you're serving every day. You're the property of the military. You belong to them. They expect you to give a hundred percent, and then when something happens to you, and something is taken from you, or you are hurt. Like you said, and I think that is the trauma of the military for men and women that that you, in many cases, are an object. And that is what's also so uh, traumatizing. Cara, do you think women are treated differently now in the military than when you served? And if so, how? You know, I've been out of active duty service since 2012. No, I'm sorry. I I served active duty 2001. 2000 to 2008. I'm sorry. And then I went into the reserves. So a lot has happened since I left active duty. I mean, gays are now allowed in the military. We've had the Me Too movement. So there's been a lot of change. So I can't really speak to it. I can only imagine there's been progression and movement and progress and growth. So so I really can't speak to that. I'm curious. You served for 12 years. Yes, ma'am. That's a long time. And you put up with a lot. Yes, ma'am. And at 12 years, you were relatively kind of halfway on your way to the great retirement light at the end of the tunnel. What was your decision-making process in leaving after 12 years? I Absolutely. I would have never got off, out of the military until I 
deployed. I got sexually assaulted. I came back. I was broken. I got divorced. I couldn't do it anymore. So I left and I left for about five months and I was very broken and, and searching back for my identity. So I, I joined the reserves and in the reserves, I made some rank and did some very cool things. But then some of my PTSD and my stuff came back and I asked for help and I was pretty well advised to move, to move on and to retire. That breaks my heart. That, that that does to think of the service that you did and then and then not having the kind of follow up that the military appears to be aware of the need for it right support. now and the support so can you go back to the VA and and request support right now and I do know that the Veterans Ranch Central Oregon Veterans Ranch has been also helpful so tell us about what the VA does and the ranch yes ma'am I- I have nothing but amazing things to say about the VA. I left the active duty service and I worked for the VA as a clinical nurse and then a nurse practitioner. I have also received very good, excellent, supportive care from the VA. Financial as far as a disability as well as medical care. It it was very clinical, very sterile. Um, it wasn't until I moved to Bend, Oregon, and honestly, I met Allison Perry at COVO, Central Oregon Veterans Outreach, where she was the executive director at the time, and she sort of took me under her wing, and she continued to continue my recovery, and she really saved my life, honestly. And then I became a part of her organization, Central Oregon Veterans Ranch. I became part of the medical team, and I was the original licensee for the adult foster home. Cara put in an amazing amount of work. She's she's probably done the equivalent of a full-time job. Like she said, she is the one who really, really got us the license, the state license with the foster home, which was a lot of work. And as you know, government, there's a lot of bureaucracy. And, <laughs> no, and, and she's really. been incredibly patient with you know the whole process because it's a nonprofit startup, and it's very different than the military and the structure of the military. <laughs> and you have consistent funding in the military. And so (laughs) with a nonprofit startup, there are a lot of false starts. And she's just been incredible and so dedicated. And what I see in her is that the same same service that she did in the military is what she has offered to the ranch. And that's why it's, for me, it's an incredible experience to build an organization with with people like Cara. Oh, absolutely. I'm curious, do you find... You know, the military, you said, was structured. What's the difference between working for the military and then a nonprofit, as Allison's talking about? How is that for you? Very painful. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> I won't lie. I enjoyed the um, military structure. I also enjoyed the constant funding. <laughs> I really, really enjoy when I said, please do this. And they said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and in the nonprofit, they're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> huh? And I ask Allison, where's the money? Where's my desk? Where's this? It doesn't happen. Yeah, it's been very frustrating, but but such a learning and growing experience as well. It, the two blended is is probably where we should <laughs> should hopefully end up. But mm-hmm. it, it's been an interesting transition. So I um I like when Allison calls me Major Kelly. <laughs> it still feeds my ego a little. Cara, what advice or wisdom would you like to share with women who are considering enlisting? Would you encourage them to enlist, and if so, why? Absolutely. I Like I said, I have a huge love for the military. Any male or female who are considering it, I think it's an incredible, incredible career opportunity. I have two bonus children for myself, two step kids, and I talk to them freely about the military. I encourage it. What I would say, education is huge. I mean, I won't lie, going in as a commissioned officer versus an enlisted E1 it was probably a better experience. I had a pretty elite experience, if you will, being an officer. I would encourage people to don't enlist unless you have somebody by your side, a mom or a dad or a parent who can communicate well with the recruiter. Education, education, education. You know, a lot of people go into the military because they want to afford their education, but then they get into the military and the stresses are so huge. There's no time for education and they get deployed and so on and so on. And however, there are tons of resources and tons of money within the 
within the military to get your education and I guess I think education is the key. So you're saying education before in that is ultimate for yeah. sure. Okay. I, I won't lie. Life is much better going into the military as an officer mm-hmm. as an O one versus an E one. Absolutely. Have I you have, thought about being a recruiter? I should be one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. I think you could be you honest, know? direct. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I I think that's a really good idea. Uh, what about for women specifically? What would you say to women considering going into the military? Be strong. Talk. Use your voice. Be who you are. That's it. Just be you. Kara, I think that is amazing advice for all of us. Exactly. We, we can all take that direction. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Are there any last words of wisdom you would care to impart with us? I think I would just like to say, please continue to support Central Oregon Veterans Ranch and all of our veterans organizations. We greatly need them, and I'm grateful and respect them all. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. That's amazing. You've been listening to a KPOV Critical Conversation. To hear more engaging interviews on important topics, please visit kpov.org slash critical dash conversations.